Aloha, my name is Larry Grimm. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and the program Don't Just Age, Engage. I'm your host today. And at the end of this time together, you will have considered some factors that have to do with whether or not you will have a delightful death. Now, I know that uh, seems like a strange topic and, and uh, an awful lot of our programs on Think Tech Hawaii have to do with uh, issues, community issues, uh, cultural issues, social issues that we need to deal with. Uh, and my program uh, every other Tuesday here at two o'clock Hawaii time on the second Tuesday and fourth Tuesday of the month have to do with some of those, or the third Tuesday of the month, have to do with some of those internal uh, dimensions of, of aging. And uh, my, my concern is that you don't get caught up in just sliding down down the slope of age into oblivion, but that you are engaged in what can be the most creative and wonderful time of your life. And so we, we're considering today the end game, dying. And it is very much a part of our conversation these days. Uh, how often, how when I get up in the morning, I take a look at the COVID-19 uh, numbers. I wonder how many new uh, cases are on Oahu and in the state of Hawaii. I wonder how many are hospitalized. And then, of course, I wonder how many are dying from COVID-19 disease of the, uh, from that, uh, from the virus that we're all engaged in combating. Uh, not only that, but we also have been very much aware in the past couple of weeks of some very important celebrities who have died. <laughs> Uh, they've caught our attention long ago. We as uh, baby boomer, boomers grew up in our early years <clears throat> learning the comedy of Betty White and following her through her various incarnations in TV shows and then her, her, her marriage to, to uh, Lud Alan Ludden. Um, Betty White died. She was two, two weeks or so and a few minutes short of a hundred year birthday. But I suggest that we um, give her that 100 years. She lived into her 100th year and was living through it. So yes, Betty White was 100 years old, as far as I'm concerned. Had a remarkable spirit of a woman. We are, we, we, we are reflecting, can't go through Facebook pages without reflecting on Betty's accomplishments and her contributions to our society. Bishop Tutu, for those of us who have been classically engaged in peacemaking, social justice concerns, particularly from a Christian point of view. Bishop Tutu died. He too was in his 90s or late years. And he, we have uh, been celebrating the contribution that he made in his words and in his spirit and his, his wisdom. And that we are grateful for all that that still lingers and continues on as an expression of, of his uh, convictions and spiritual life and his leadership in the church of Jesus Christ. And then there's Dan Reeves. Those of us who have been football admirers are familiar with Dan Reeves and his contribution to the, uh, to, to the, to the Cowboys, the Dallas Cowboys, and to football in general. John Madden, another one. And, and as, as I list these, I, I don't know about you, but I'm very much aware of how I think, oh, oh this is, here comes, here comes death and dying moving in on me. And indeed, that's true for all of us. When I got, when I passed uh, 65, I passed my uh, retirement as a Presbyterian pastor in pastoral roles. But I continued working as uh, a minister in um, long-term care as a chaplain, trained chaplain, and in hospice care as professional trained chaplain and uh, professional pastoral counselor. And in that context, I, of course, was very much confronted with death and dying <laughs> daily. And there were times that I would walk into a room and I'd say, oh, I wonder if that's me in that bed uh, preparing to die at this time and, and in this type of death. I never know for sure, of course. But it becomes something that we're conscious of. And... Uh, and that's why I began to turn my attention to some questions about how to die. Uh, I began, I read a lot and I've listened to uh, many lectures, particularly on uh, YouTube from 
uh, Alan Watts, who was a perfect, who was a, a popular um, philosopher in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even into the 90s, in which uh, and and dedicated as he was to integrating the, the philo philosophical orientation between Orientalism, the Orient, and Western thinking, and I found a rich, rich uh, exposure to some incredible insights about life and death and dying. And I'll share a little bit about that with you today. One of the things that um, that Alan Watts stressed was back in the 90s, we need to have more people who will help us with ha have a delightful death. And that kept, caught my attention, having a delightful death. Um, and I found that the, those people exist. And they have been generated since the 70s across the world and across the globe in a professional manner. And I want to share that with you a little bit today as um, some understanding of how you can have, and we can all have, a delightful death. Hospice care are the people that I'm talking about. Hospice care is built around four pains, we call it. Dom Cecily Saunders, who originated the concept of hospice care in this nation, brought it over from England, identified four, four pains that people have as they enter into this aging process in these last few months of life. She said there were pains that were uh, physical pain, of course, and most of us get dragged into aging through physical pains. There were relational pains, what, how that impacted uh, family life, uh, marriages, uh, the relationship to friends and the cultural attitudes that are born with in our society about death and dying. Not any of which I think on, in general are too popular or too pleasant. I think our social, we have to come to terms with the fact that our society is afraid of dying and hates aging. The third, uh, third area is the economics, of course, of uh, health care, <clears throat> of living, of continuing to live even into through the dying process. And then fourth are the spiritual dimensions of, of the patient and, the, and their family life. What are the spiritual beliefs, the spiritual orientation, the inner life, the emotions, and the content of those belief systems that inform people as they move towards death and dying? I had the privilege of sharing the spiritual dimensions with many, many people, people in my hospice care as part of a, an interdisciplinary team. Each uh, patient that comes into hospice care, and I, was, I served on Oahu with Bristol Hospice, and each patient that comes into hospice care has a, assigned to them a physician, <clears throat> a nurse, <clears throat> a CNA, social worker, and a spiritual caregiver. So that all four of those, um, all four of those pains, the total pain, uh, is addressed and supported. Now, what was the biggest obstacle to providing a delightful, a delightful death? Well, the biggest obstacle to providing a delightful death was and patients and family members who enrolled their family member with one week, three days left in their dying process. They didn't get to experience the total support, the total system of support and uh, nurture that we offered. And uh, that began to trigger my thinking about, about death and dying, again, about the process that we go through. And we ch many of us choose to feel as though we are not going to die, and we're just going to go on living until death catches us by surprise. This is what I call the uh, um, the emergency landing. <laughs> I was uh, have a metaphor for that because when I was in uh, Richmond, Virginia, in seminary, I took a trip from Richmond, Virginia, to Raleigh, North Carolina, at, on what we call the puddle jumper. So we were up high above the clouds. <laughs> flying down the, uh, the coast and in between the Appalachian Mountains 
and the and the coast. And as you know from from our own experience here on Oahu, there can be wide ranges of uh, types of, of weather experiences. Well, this this one day it was very rainy. We were flying above a cloud system all the way, and uh, we got over the the airport in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the and the uh, pilot came on the PA system. The pilot said, "Well, we have thick thick coverage over the um, over the uh, <clears throat> airport. I can't just go down through it. I have to wait until there's an opening." And we, we think there will be an opening soon. So we'll cruise about and circle up above the clouds until that opening comes. <coughs> so they circled them. So we did indeed circle above the clouds and an opening came and the pilot said, I have an opening, I'm going down. And, the, and he, from that high, high elevation, just took a nose dive, it seemed, down through the opening that had come in the clouds, zoom down to the, all the way down to the, to a landing level, the approach land a level, and for me it was a white knuckle experience. I grabbed those, I grabbed those uh, those uh, seat, grabbed that seat and held on dear life. <laughs> it felt like a roller coaster ride, right from the top to the bottom. Many of us think death will do that to us. We'll, we'll catch us by surprise, like we've got to go now. And gonna, I'm going to deny it, hold it off, not prepare for it. I'll just, I'll just wait until that happens. But there's another way to look at this, and I call it the uh, Oahu landing, landing in Oahu. Planes who come in to land, that come in to land in Oahu start a, a descent many, many miles away. And the descent is gradual and it's calm and it's peaceful. And in fact, it gives you a chance to look around and see the see the beauty of the island as you come in. If you're sitting at a window seat or to look at the ocean. And that to me is, is what I want to offer as a, a life coach, which I do, focusing on an extraordinary elderhood for you. And as a life coach, to have that end game there before us always, and the approach be gradual, and the approach to it be calm, and the approach to it be well prepared for a delightful experience. Now, what are some of the things that you can ask in order to have a delightful death? The majority of us, uh, 80 to 90% of us over 60 want to die at home. Here on the island, that means about 220, 220, 220,000 of us want to die at home. And because they're, they're well, that, in Hawaii, in Hawaii, the 200, 200, a uh, quarter of the population is, as I understand it, is uh, over 65. And so we're looking at a large number of people who want to die at home. What are we doing? What are you doing to prepare? Again, what I've said we found in hospice care is we have this rich assemblage of people with talents and abilities in these four areas of life. And um, oftentimes didn't get to share those with the family members and the dying patient because it, they, they waited until last minute to enroll in hospice care. But if you enroll in hospice care several miles out, the approach is gradual and calm, and the learning and the growth and the experience of life at this time of life is, is remarkable and cannot be duplicated any place. It becomes your experience, of course. It is your experience, and it's a gift to you, in my opinion, that we all provide work to provide, and um, and to and to by enhancing those that time of life. Now, but what are some of the questions? What are some of the ways to do that? Well, one of the things that I think is important is to to ask your physician some questions. I'm going to ask my physician, given what you know about my health about my uh, 
patterns. How do you imagine I am going to die? Am I going to contract COPD? Am I going to die of a fall? Am I going into or complications of obesity? How do you imagine, knowing what you know about me, I will die? Now, interesting, interestingly, we are in an era, age with an incredibly beneficial age of technology because all the record keeping goes into one chart, at least for me, I'm, I'm part of the my chart system with the Queens medical system. And all of my doctor, I have three doctors that have made input into this one chart. And I can view the chart, I can view all the test results that come from various blood panels. I can view all of uh, my comments from the physicians that are noted in the chart and keep on track and keep track of it. And most importantly, my primary care physician, who's an internal medicine doc, can look at those and follow those. And she gets a sense of the patterns that I follow. And, and so here's all this wonderful information available to us, available to her, because of the technology of the age. And I would suggest to you that if you have not benefited from that yet, that you find a way that you can, either through one of the hospital connections or, or uh, on the island Straub or, or, or the Queens. Um, and just ask your physician, how, how can you get the information? How can we get the information in a centralized way? And then ask them, what, how do you see me dying? Now, physicians are, of course, devoted to the living. Physicians are devoted to healing. And uh, it may be that one of the things that you'll first encounter is a resistance to talking about it by your physician. Because the physician wants to focus on <laughs> what's going to give you life. Thank God that's true. But also, is if you see that you're dying as part of your living, it does also something that has to do with life. And living the life, uh, the life of uh, death process is what I am hopeful that you will be able to do. So, what? How do you see me dying, Doc? How do you, from the patterns that I have shown you? Imagine my last days, my last hours. There are ways that we can anticipate how that will be. For instance, in hospice care, we have had guidelines um, with regard to the dying process. And if you look, uh, I have a, a, the first one I would like to put up for us to look at is um, several months out from the dying process, we can see some uh, some things in the pattern of, of uh, succumbing to disease. Uh, by the way, Dr. Louise Aronson in her book, Elderhood, has said that no one dies from old age. We die from disease, we die from falls. A lot of men die at the foot of a ladder because they think they should be up there uh, cleaning out their, cleaning out their uh, gutters. But uh, but if we if we are indeed have some sort of disease, uh, then we are, can anticipate some of the effects of that disease on our bodies in the dying process. So there's one to two months out from death itself. We can anticipate one to several months out what 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 will what we will be able to see in ourselves and uh, and our loved ones. There's a kind of withdrawal from the world and from other people desire to be more alone. And uh, in fact, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said this experience of, can be an experience of depression in which people turn their backs literally on their family members. You'll walk into the room to visit your loved one who's dying and he or she may say, I don't wanna, I just don't wanna talk. I don't wanna be with you today. So yes, going back to our list, a withdrawal from the world. There's a decrease in food intake. This can bother us 
loved ones a great deal because we, you know, eating food and receiving food is a way of feeling uh, love. So, but there's the, a decreased food intake that we go through. Now going back again, Eric, to the list, we sleep more, increased sleep. There's a withdrawal inside self, and there's just less overall communication with with those around us. One to three, one to three months, we'll see that kind of uh, pattern begin to emerge. And for uh, and even and for me, being a gregarious uh, person who likes to talk with friends and family, I could easily feel as though you know I, I'm doing something wrong. It's not fair. But it's not something wrong. It's just the way it is. This is the way I need to, to pull back. Now, as we get closer, the next um, in with one or two weeks, we'll see some other things. So we may feel disoriented and agitated. We may be talking with unseen family members who have died and gone before us. There may be some confusion and some picking at clothes. Blood pressure decreases, pulse increases or decreases. Skin color changes. We may find ourselves more pale or blue. Respiration ir irregularity set in. Congestion and, and sleeping but responding. Complaints about the body being tired and heavy. Again, no eating, taking little fluid. A body temperature can be extremes, hot or cold. So you see that how we are able to begin to track in, a, in ourselves as we get close to the dying experience how the body responds to these different, um, in, in these different ways. Finally, and when there's a, a few days, hours or days, um, <clears throat> the, there's an increase of the one or two weak signs. There's uh, a surge of energy can happen. Uh, one, one thing that I remember is one, one of my um, family, one of my uh, church members, came to church one, I was very ill, came out of the hospital and came to church Sunday night. And she said, oh, I just feel so wonderful. I feel exuberant. And then she died in the, the next Thursday. Sometimes there's that peak of energy before the final dying day. And uh, depression can set in, blood pressure, eye, eyes can get glassy, tearing, half opened, irregular breathing, uh, stopping and starting, a kind of apnea type breathing restlessness, or else no, no activity at all. Um, decreased urine output. Uh, may we, uh, may, we may stool in the bed and things uh, that will embarrass us, certainly, uh, if we're, as we have cognizance. Uh, now, during this time, of course, palliative care is active. And if you ask for palliative care, you ask for or uh, morphine and other drugs that will keep you from hurting. And uh, this will give family members some frustrations because it becomes more difficult to communicate. Finally, in the final hours of death and dying process, there's a, we begin to breathe like a fish out of water and we fall asleep and can't be awakened. Now I put this up, if, you, if, if you'd like to have this list, send me an email and I'll be glad to to send that list to you. It can be helpful in monitoring how family members are doing um, as they go through the dying process. But I had one, one patient who said, I'm an engineer, I wanna know what to expect. And I gave him this list and he was so thrilled because he can say, I, I'm doing this, I can see myself doing this and doing this. So he used it to monitor himself. But also this is to emphasize, I want to emphasize with you how important it is to have this long approach, lengthened approach so that you have time to do the conversations and time to experience the joys and celebrations of life well lived together with family members and friends. So how my physician, how am I going to die? How do you see me dying uh, at this point? If I, if I taking away the possibility of COVID maybe, taking away the possibility of, of, uh, of, uh, of an accident, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> of accidental death. Uh, so, um, and then we have other plans, things to go through about 
about our, our home site. How do we want to stock our home? How do we want to prepare? There, it, you can talk these things over with a social worker, with a, with a chaplain. You can talk these things over with a deaf doula if you want to hire a deaf doula to come help plan. And one of the things that um, I enjoyed tremendously was um, an experience of dying with one of my patients who had opted for the our care, our choice, our care, use of medically assisted death. She had planned it so that all friends would come together. She had one friend who did a hula. I read a poem. Some others just remembered her. Um, and they were there and then finally toasted with champagne before she took the uh, medically assist, medical assistance and, and died herself. It was truly a delightful death. But this can be planned according to um, I mean, uh, uh, to your wishes, on a long-range view of dying, and that's what we try to foster. That's what I try to foster. Ultimately, the most important thing is your inner orientation. What do you believe about death and dying? One of my favorite quotes from John Donne, who was a minister, a Scottish minister in the uh, 1700s, is that poem, Death Be Not Proud. I have just a... A quick uh, snippet of that poem here to share with you. Death be not proud, Eric. Death be not proud, though some have called thee mighty and dreadful, for thou art not. Thou art not so. For those whom thou thinkest thou dost overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet hence thou kill me. So part of the process of preparation is identifying how you feel and what are your orientations towards death and dying. You and, and life beyond death. <clears throat> there are plenty of people who share with us their experiences of death beyond dying and life beyond death. And for you to look at that, their experience is, is a, a rich way of understanding your own positions. Uh, some, some cultures think if we talk about dying that we'll bring on our death. I don't believe that. Um, I think talking about death is a way of experiencing life more fully. How can I talk with my friends? There are passages and ways, uh, systems available to have conversations with families. I use living will, five, wish, five wishes. Uh, um, friends, this is a wonderful experience. I come back every two weeks to uh, look at the inner life, spiritual dimensions of aging. So, because I want you not just to age, but to engage. Aloha and have a wonderful two weeks. I'll see you here again in two weeks.